Uh, I got three more minutes till the first pitch. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to call this New Market Town Council business meeting to order, June 3rd. Um, start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, just a quick note to counselors. I realized after the agenda was printed that the minutes show up as being first thing addressed and by the rules of procedure that we adopted, it should be second. We should be doing the public forum first. So we'll follow the agenda for right now and um, future we'll be doing the, not the uh, public forum before the minutes. So with that, I'll take a motion for accepting the May 18th organizational meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Any discussions? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote, please. Aye. 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 Uh, the May 20th meeting minutes, um, I understand, I know I only had parts of them. Um, I'd like to know if the council is good with moving that to the next meeting for approval. Yes. Okay, so, so we will move that to um, the meeting on the 17th, June 17th workshop. Thank you. And now for the public forum. Anyone from the public like to speak? Yes. Um, I'm Judith Ryan, 125 Main Street. Um, I would like to read three letters, first one being mine. This is to the New York Town Council. You have received my letter of resignation for the, from the Advisory Heritage Commission in response to the Town Council's disregard of the criteria for membership set forth in Resolution 2000-12 relating to the establishment of an Advisory Heritage Commission. I quote, the Council shall appoint membership which shall consist of people who demonstrate an interest and ability to understand and appreciate the historic values of the community. You had before you three candidates for appointment to two seats on the commission. In my opinion, you have had one and only one person fill the page who met the criteria and had the experience and knowledge of the importance of historic preservation. You chose by majority vote to ignore that criteria. I personally want to thank all the previous commission members and the numerous of volunteers who have served and worked diligently to preser preserve the historic and cultural aspects of our community. Second letter is from Michael Dowling. Dear Mr. LeBranch, it was distressing to learn of the Council's decision to allow Philip LePage's appointment to the Historic Advisory Commission to lapse. Prior to my own March 19, 2009 appointment to the Advisory Heritage Commission, I was concerned that after many years of preparatory work, there seemed to be very little support and or consensus about historic preservation in Newmarket. The sudden decision by the newly elected council to change the makeup of the new advisory commission prior to any meeting or discussion seems to confirm that our community is not yet prepared to engage in a historic preservation effort. Accordingly, I submit my resignation from the Advisory Heritage Commission effective immediately. <coughs> the, second, the third letter is from Mr. Glennon. At the May 20th council meeting, the council voted by majority vote to appoint an individual Mrs. Jar Jen Jennifer Jarvis to the Advisory Heritage Commission and the newly created Historic District Commission. <coughs> According to the requirements set forth by the Planning Board and passed by the Council, the uh, following requirements are required by for an appointment to the Historic District Commission. Commission members shall have expertise or an interest in one or more of the following areas. Historic preservation, architecture, 
real estate appraising, real estate brokerage, construction trades, economic and economic revitalization. Preferably, at least one regular or alter alternate member shall be an architect. On Thursday, October 9, 2008, <coughs> at 1026 p.m., in an email, Jen Jarvis wrote to the following, to, to, wrote to a member of the planning board and said, for said document to be read publicly. At the, and the following is a quote from the email presented by Janice Rosa. I want you to know that I am 100% against creating a his local historic district commission. This should be the decision of the taxpayers, not the people who want to make rules. So the question becomes, how does the council appoint someone who clearly does not have the qualifications to serve on this board? I see two issues. Ms. Jarvis does not m meet the requirements, and two, Ms. Jarvis clearly does not understand who makes the rules. It is the council who adopts and, and votes on rules, and through that process, the council must adhere to its rules by virtue of the charter. Therefore, it is with regret that I submit my letter of resignation as a member of the Advisory Heritage Commission. Thank you. Copies. The second. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Any other public comment? No. Yes. Forbes Kitchell, 51 North Main Street, and I'm not going to take you over the barrel. I just want to say thank all of you people for taking the job. It's a thankless job. The job of Heritage Advisory Committee was obviously a thankless job. We worked many, many hours, days, weeks. And, of course, we didn't get it all right, or we wouldn't have turned it all down, would we? So, just remember this, you have a responsibility. This town is wonderful. I moved here in 1951. I moved from Durham. I wouldn't live in Durham if it paid me the taxes. <laughs> I had a house that I could have moved in. I love this place. So many people around here are just wonderfully intelligent, good, people please think of the fact the heritage committee is trying to preserve history that's what we're talking about you know where love the land road is bay road these little things you ought to know and you know something i think you all ought to get a History of Newmarket happens to be that my wife wrote it, but I think all of you people should study as much of the history of this town as you can, because it's important that you know back there what happened, as well as what happens up here. Thank you so much. I'll see you sometime. Thank you, Mr. Gatchell. Yes, Mr. Pickering. Good evening, Councilors, Town Administrator Wanowski, and Erica. I'm here representing myself this evening, <clears throat> and I am a, a current member of the Town Budget Committee, but uh, I'm not here representing them. I'm speaking for myself. Back a few months ago, we were, as we, the Budget Committee was going over the, uh, the Town Budget, one of the items that uh, popped up for me was the fact that the new lights in the downtown area had come on and I brought up the suggestion that perhaps we could shut those off and uh, there would be a savings to the community. Uh, today I did a little bit of, actually I do have a life but I found time this afternoon to do a little bit of inventorying downtown and I found that the old lights down there in the stretch from the Eagles to the Riverworks, there were 13 of them. Those, those are the original lights that lit Main Street. There are now 42 to 44 additional lights in that same stretch along with the 13. So we have 55 to 57 lights lighting a strip that used to be lit with 13. Um, I 
I called PSNH uh, today uh, <coughs> to find out if they had received an order uh, to d disconnect those 13 lights that I had suggested uh, back uh, a few months ago, and, and I was told no. Uh, what that is costing the town is an additional $377.65 per month uh, while they're running. The problem is they're not, they're not on. You might go down there tonight and say, what, is he crazy? Uh, they're not on. That's correct. They are not on because they have photocells on them. And there's so much light from the other 43 lights, these lights can't even come on any longer. So we're paying for something we're not getting, and I think the council should take a look at that. I realize it's not huge dollars, uh, but uh, during these times, we should be looking at every dollar. And uh, I do have some questions um, in reference to the new lighting. 43 or 44, 42 to 44 lights, uh, additional lights. Uh, I'd like to know what the cost of, of, the, of that lighting is. I, I have no idea what that cost is, and I would like to know what that is. And the, and the fixture lamps, what, what are the size, what are the wattages in those new, uh, new lamps that are down there? Uh, there are a, a number of them that have uh, a, a, a fixture that hangs over the sidewalk and on the same pole is a, a fixture that hangs over the road. I kind of wonder if we actually do need all of that or not. I, I realize that they're nice looking. It did enhance the downtown. We, do we really need all that light? Uh, it seems like it's just an overkill. 57 lights in an area that once held 13 that, that suffice for the downtown. And, and I would like to comment that I believe if, if some of those lights were turned off, they don't have to be removed, but it's just a suggestion. I do know we have an energy committee uh, in place, and perhaps that's something they're going to be looking at in the future anyways. But if some of those were turned off, they wouldn't have to be removed. You could still leave them there for the uh, aesthetic looks of the fixture, I suppose. Um, it just seems to me like a 57 lights in, a, in an area, you'd be hard pressed anywhere in the state of New Hampshire to find 57 street lights in a stretch from the Eagles down to Riverworks. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pickering. Um, did you have some answers? Um, can we hold it for old new business? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment at 714. Uh, next on the agenda. Um, Ms. Cooper, is your group here? You? They're, they're all here? Well, Brian's not here, but we're not sure where he is, so. <laughs> Sabrina's going to take his place. <coughs> He's at a baseball game. So oh, I okay. Might, might do that. And All right. Um, so then we'll, we'll hold off just a second. We'll go with item number two, if that's okay. All right. So that would be um, artificial recharge, Jane, Jamie Emery and Sean Craig, our wastewater superintendent. What do we get for number three? <laughs> How about if we do the resolution? That should be fairly quick, right? Okay, let, let's do that, and that'll give uh, town administrator a chance to do what he needs to get done. So, councilors, if you have no problems, I'd like to go right to number three on the agenda. One of these nights, we'll get them in order. Okay, um, this is a resolution. 200809-23, an upgrade to the wastewater treatment facility. And I 
get the pleasure of doing this. Town of Newmarket, New Hampshire by the Newmarket Town Council Resolution 2008-09-23 authorized sewer department to assist the EPA in permit negotiations and review draft nutrient criteria not to exceed $20,000. Whereas on May 20th, 2009, the Newmarket Town Council voted to hire Underwood engineers to perform work associated with the EPA's administrative order required wastewater treatment facility improvements. And whereas the cost to assist in the permit negotiations with the EPA and represent the town in reviewing draft nutrient criteria is $5,000 to $10,000 each total not to exceed $20,000. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Town Council does hereby approve the amount not to exceed $20,000. Said funds to be taken from the Sewer Department Capital Reserve Fund. Given at the Town Council Chambers in Newmarket, New Hampshire, this third day of June in the year of our Lord, 2009. Do I have a motion to Accept resolution 2008. Uh, discussion. I guess perhaps, Mr. Craig, if would you like to just speak on this, or does the council have enough information from the last meeting? Uh, are, we, are we good with this? Yep. Okay. Then moving on. Um, if there's no discussion, I see no lights. I'll call for the vote. Council Carr. Aye. Council Minutelli? Aye. Council Bottomman? Aye. Council Quox? Aye. Council Dickens? Aye. Council Bergeron? Aye. Chairman Branch? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. <coughs> now we can go to item number one. Ah. Perfect. Perfect. How about Perfect. that, huh? The question is, did he win or lose? <coughs> <coughs> um, Link together pocket park update. Um, before we get started, I'd, I'd just like to say, say that I'm glad to see all of you here this evening. Um, I know you've put a lot of time and effort into trying to get the pocket park um, looking better, something that's a little bit of a showcase, and you should be proud of that. I know that the town council and the town administrator have often put little problems in your plans by... Uh, putting little buildings on the site and things of that <laughs> nature, but trust me, it'll all go away soon and, and we can get this thing finished. So with that, I believe there is a presentation that's available. Um, so they're going to do the first reading. They're going to do the and first reading? And then, then be the representative. Okay. Let's go with the first reading. First reader. What we've done so far to meet our goals. The first year we talked about what we wanted to put into the park and what our plans were for the park. We wrote our first Disney Mini Grant and we were awarded it. With the $500 that we were awarded, we bought rakes, shovels, garbage bags, gloves, and paint. We cleaned the park. We also washed the retaining wall and painted it white and to get rid of all the graffiti that was on it. Next is Serena Ricardo. If I may interrupt for just a second, that was Madison, correct? Yeah. Madison Teague. Madison Teague. The second year we went several web to several websites and decided what we wanted to put in the park. Then we invited members of the town council to our meetings to share with them what we wanted to put in the park and see what they thought about our ideas. We, we listened to their opinions and changed some of the things that we had planned to include their ideas. We wrote several other grants. We were awarded for the second time another $500 for the Disney Mini Grant. This time, the money would be spent for the mail. We were unable to paint the mail because of the construction. The Disney Mini Grant people extended the project deadline until April 2009. Next is Stephen Cooper.
We presented our plan to the town council on April 16, 2008 and received approval of the council to put our plan into action with the assistance of Mr. W. We applied to the Sunkist Corporation to win a lemonade stand to raise money. To do this, we had to write a 500-word essay as to how we would use the money we raised with the lemonade stand. They liked our essay and sent us a lemonade stand. With the construction, we are unable to use it. We will be using it this year. We, have, we held our second annual park cleanup. Next, we have Haley Foster. In our third year this year, we had to put our time and efforts into raising money to buy the equipment. <coughs> we'll need to raise $7,532.48 to put everything that we want to in the park. We sold candy bars at the November 4th presidential election. We had posters of our cleanup efforts and what we wanted to put into the park. A woman from the community who was voting stopped at our booth. She liked what we were doing and gave us her email address. She works at Bottom Line Technology and asked us to write a proposal and she would present it to her company. We did that and they agreed to give us $300 for the bench. Next is Julia Haas. We then wrote a proposal to PSNH. I gave it to my Uncle Matt who works at PSNH. He took it to them and they gave us a check for $900. We made Christmas ornaments and held a mini craft fair for the parents of Lake Together. We applied for the pa Cla Captain Planet Grant for $900 for a second bench for the park. We were supposed to have heard from them in mid-April. Next is Adele Baudet. We contacted Timberland to see if they would partner with us on our project. We met with Tom Roberts and Jennifer Keith on February 12, 2009. They agreed to partner with us. Then on March 12, 2009, we met with Mr. Michael Provost. He gave us pictures and information about the mills and bridge that floated <coughs> away in the first floods. We decided that we wanted to use the mills and, a bri and the bridge as our mural. Jennifer contacted us with City Air and we began working on the design with them for the mural for the wall. We painted the mural with members of City Air on April 29, 2009. Next is Ryan Hamill. We submitted an application to Dollars for Change grant for seed money of $1,193.33 to buy startup supplies to sell more candy bars, have a lemonade stand, make a quilt to raffle, and hold a scarecrow contest. We plan to take that money and make a profit of $3,830.51. We were, when we were writing this grant, we had to plan what we wanted to do for our fundraisers, what the cost was to run each fundraiser, and figure out how much we would sell everything to make a profit. Next is Brooke. We have just finished working on a youth venture New England grant for $1,000. This grant was a workbook with activities that we had to complete to write the, the grant. We have learned how to write SMART goals. Every member of the group was given a role and responsibilities. We made a timeline of activities for a, for a year. We came up with ways to continue with our project once the $1,000 seed money was spent. Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Counselors or administrator, do we have any questions? No one has a question. I'm, I'm sure they're all just waiting for a question. <laughs> I'll ask one. Counselor Dickens. What was the hardest part about going after all this money? I mean, you guys seem to be more successful than most people out there at raising money. So what was the hardest part that you had to, to overcome? I 
I think the hardest part of it was doing the budgets and getting all the money and going to get the stuff that we need to paint the mural. Budgets are always fun. Yes. <laughs> Town Administrator? You had mentioned you're going to be selling lemonade. You're, you're going to be using your stand. Where are you going to be doing that? <laughs> we haven't decided where, when, or where we're going to do it yet. Did you hit? Try it again because it didn't go off. Yeah, it might be that. One. Okay, you might have to wave to me because it's not working tonight. Council uh, Fox. Maybe a suggestion would be to sell the lemonade at the um, <coughs> the farmers market that they're going to be having up at the um, mm. the Stone, Stone Church. Church. I think it starts June twentieth. Yes. Twenty first. <laughs> no twentieth. It's a good idea. Something good to idea. think about. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I. Th whoops. You get. I just wanted to say thank you to to you all for what you're doing for that little park. I think it's great. Yes. If there's nothing else from the council, I do believe that Representative Abbott is here. Um, would like to say something to the Link Together group? Sure. Can I use the box? <laughs> <laughs> it was short. <coughs> Thank you. Welcome to the new councilors, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Administrator. How many of you children have met Governor Lynch? I think most of you have. Okay. I think you probably met him with me. Did he take the opportunity to sit down and talk to you about different things? I'll just quick check and whether you listened or not. <laughs> <laughs> did, the, did the governor talk about his cats? Yeah. How many cats does the governor have? Five. Yeah. Close. He always talks to the fourth graders about his cats. And what was his favorite cat's name? Was it Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah Harry Potter. <laughs> well, the reason I bring up the governor is that Ms. Cooper asked me if I would talk to the governor about recognizing the efforts that you kids have made down with the pocket park. So the governor does like to recognize what everyone does and especially what children do. So he was more than glad to sign a proclamation for you, a commendation. And I would like to read that and present that to you as a group. It starts by saying State of New Hampshire by His Excellency John H. Lynch Governor, a commendation to the Link Together volunteers. Whereas more than 35 local volunteers from Link Together, the town government and local businesses are planning, cleaning, and refurbishing a local park at one of the gateways of the Main Street. And whereas approximately 500 elementary school children and their families will have a safe place to sit and read a book or talk when they are in the downtown area. And whereas children have presently raised fourteen hundred ninety five dollars we could probably use some of that money to balance the state budget right now <laughs> through fundraising efforts such as candy bar sales lemonade sales a mini craft fair of the total of seventy five hundred and thirty three dollars needed to replace benches tables and make other improvements to the park and have plans to hold additional fundraisers and whereas the students have improved their public speaking, as we saw tonight, teamwork, writing aptitude, and mathematical skills by engaging in the various steps necessary to complete and implement this project. And whereas these young volunteers have learned to apply for grants and have been awarded two Disney mini grants, each worth $500, which they have used towards purchasing supplies for their annual cleanup and to paint a mural on the existing retaining wall at the park. And whereas students gained competence and confidence as they learned to work together as a team and saw their project come together, and whereas the students wrote two, propos two proposals 
one to bottom line technology and one to PSNH and receive funds from the above businesses, $300 and $900 respectively. And whereas the students furthered their writing and public speaking skills, preparing and submitting a successful proposal to partner with Timbaland Corporation. Now, therefore I, John Lynch, Governor of the State of New Hampshire, do hereby commend the Link Together volunteers in recognition of their hard work, dedication, and service to, the, to their community and state. The valuable life skills these young volunteers have acquired will prove to be long lasting, and it will. Given at the executive chamber in Concord this 14th day of May in the year of our Lord, 2009, and the independence of the United States of America, 233, sign John Lynch, Governor, State of New Hampshire. Congratulations. And we also thought, I'll give the credit really to Ms. Cooper because she's doing a lot of this thinking in the background. She thought that each of you should get a copy of the commendation. So I think probably the easiest way is I'll give one to you and shake your hand. How's that? And I think that I'd like to present the master copy to read. Thank you. <laughs> I do. I'm more than pleased to do this. I think that the kids in town deserve to be recognized for the, for the good things they do, and I hope we have more opportunities to do this in the future. So I'm, I welcome the opportunity to come down tonight and do this. Thank you all. Thank you, Representative Abbott. And thank you, Link Together. Keep up the good work. And I bet you guys have homework, right? <laughs> <laughs> homework. With that, um, if we could get Emery and Garrett back up here. <laughs> We lost our audience. There's our audience. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I got all excited. There's extra candy here if anyone wants it. I've been one of those. Good evening. How are you? <laughs> I don't know if I can follow that up. <laughs> um, I'm here tonight because um, Emery and Garrett uh, was hired to do um, groundwater studies for us to look for new sources of groundwater. And they were also hired to do a uh, phase two evaluation of groundwater recharge using river water for our Bennett and Sewell wells. And they have completed the phase two study which is pretty comprehensive and what has actually come out of this study is is they gave it to the state to review and the state really liked what they saw they thought it looked like such a really good project so um, they asked the state asked me to submit a application for American Recovery Act for green infrastructure because they felt that this fit was a very good fit for that. So I submitted um, the next phase um, of the project, which is a $622,000 project. And we, um, we ended up number two on the list. So we're eligible for $622,000 of American Recovery Act green infrastructure money. And what that means to the town is that we would, um, 
we would have to pay back half the 600. So we'd have to pay back 311. It'd be a 50% match grant. Um, so I've asked, um, um, I've asked uh, James Emery to come and give you a background and, and give you an update of what this report is and what they've been doing and what the next step is. So, yeah. <clears throat> Um, there's two, two presentations that Ed had asked us to uh, consider. And so we have, as you know, we're hitting the water issue on two fronts. The first front is, it, is developing additional supplies because right now New Market is entirely dependent upon two wells. And if one of those wells went out uh, or was contaminated, you would have a serious problem in, in, in supplying the town with, with water. So we're looking at additional sources of water, and we have been over the course of the last couple of years. And we have identified two sites that are uh, of high yield that are in the process of being uh, developed and permitted through uh, DES. The presentation we have tonight <coughs> is split into two parts, and I just want to give the council the option to pass on the first part if they, if they wish. The first part is the exploration and update on the exploration program, where we are and what we're planning on doing this summer. Uh, during the dry spell so we can do our pumping tests and get our, our things online and get our permits uh, hopefully the beginning of next year. The second part is the artificial recharge and I want to mention that as we said we're, we're attacking this water supply from two fronts. One is additional source and one is to take and actually skim water off the Lamprey River during the winter time and pump it into a recharge basin near the existing Sewell and Bennett wells so that we can enhance the overall yield of those wells. Uh, as you may know, that over the course of the pumping of these wells, we've actually dropped the water table <coughs> down about 14 feet in places, which puts us into a little bit of a dire condition during long-term drought. So the artificial recharge, which John will talk about, <coughs> would offset those uh, mining of water, so to speak, and enhance the overall productivity of the wells, as well as uh, the long-term sustainability of the water table in that region. So at this point, I'm just going to ask if the council wants to see both presentations. They're about 10 to 12 minutes each, so it would be about 20 minutes uh, for a slideshow, or we can cut it just artificial recharge. I'd like to see both. I'd like to see both. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, you had mentioned... Could you mention the, the loss of yes, the water Yes, the water table? table has been recorded to be 10 to 14 feet lower uh, during this dry summer times than it was historically when, we, when the, uh, uh, the wells were first put in place. And that's what uh, that started the process of considering artificial recharge, of trying to uh, take water from the river and put it into these basins. It was, it was attempted before through the treatment plant, but the, uh, there were issues with the treatment process that contaminated the groundwater, so we couldn't. Now we're talking about doing raw water. Uh, and I will say, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a real testament to the town of Newmarket, when, we, when Sean put the application in for the funding uh, at, at the state for this green infrastructure, this project, the artificial recharge, was ranked number two in the state. Uh, which, is the, which is extremely high rating for, for this type of project. It is one of the first of its kind in the state, and it's certainly leading the way as a model for uh, other communities to consider. With that, I'm going to let John speak. He's the project manager. Uh, Peter Garrett, who is uh, my partner, was supposed to speak on the artificial recharge, but he had a death in the family, and so he is, uh, John's going to cover for him tonight. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do tonight is give a, uh, as Jamie said, a fairly short uh, summary of uh, the groundwater exploration program that we have been conducting for the last couple years. And then that will be followed by, uh, quickly after that, a, a short presentation on what we've done for artific artificial recharge. Uh, some of you have heard the, the story before, so I've tried to uh, kind of cut it down to its essence. Um, the uh, groundwater um, exploration program was conducted uh, to develop additional groundwater supplies that would supplement the uh, groundwater obtained from the bedrock and sewer wells in the sand and gravel aquifer. And the other objective is that um, the, uh, this, the uh, development of bedrock wells would enhance groundwater resource protection by developing groundwater resources in a separate aquifer from your existing water resources. 
The uh, work was conducted in a series of phases, which I'll just summarize now. In uh, the first phase uh, was uh, a study in which we um, uh, conducted a pre preliminary hydrogeologic evaluation, and uh, the uh, goal of that was the selection of groundwater development zones within the town. Um, we incorporated uh, background data compilation of existing maps and uh, reports. We also did some detailed geologic mapping within the town. We uh, conducted bedrock fracture fabric and lineament analyses, and we uh, investigated potential contaminant threats uh, within the town. And all this data was compiled, and we selected areas within the town where we thought um, uh, that were favorable, most favorable for uh, conducting additional groundwater resource development studies in them and uh, selected our bedrock ground, groundwater development zones. As you can see from this map, the uh, blue line is the outline of the uh, town of Newmarket. And uh, our study uh, ended up with uh, eight groundwater development zones distributed throughout the town. Uh, two of those were considered secondary. And so um, within those zones, we uh, proceeded on to our geophysical surveys. And the ob objective there was to uh, do some really additional detailed geologic mapping in specific zones and in concert with geophysical surveys to select test well targets. And the lines that are shown over these zones indicate that we uh, conducted surveys within four of the groundwater development zones. And the decision to go within those zones was uh, uh, in large part worked out with the uh, past city council and also uh, where we could get property permission to do our surveys. We did uh, three types of geophysical surveys, magnetic uh, and VLF surveys, and also electrical resistivity survey lines. And uh, I won't show you too much of that, but I just wanted to give you a feel for the type of results we get. These are models that we created using the electrical resistivity lines. And uh, what they are basically is a cross section of the earth below two of the survey lines that we ran. And it shows the distribution of electrical uh, resistivity of the subsurface materials. And you can see near the subsurface in these models, there's uh, a dark blue area, and that's the uh, unconsolidated sediments that are fine sands to clays. And then in the subsurface are red areas and brown areas, which are the bedrock. And the green areas um, that cross-cut the bedrock are lower, lower resistivity, and they're often associated with fracture zones that can be water-bearing. And on the top profile uh, model is uh, well 2B, and then on the bottom is NGE1A. And those are the pro proposed production wells that we are presenting tonight. And you can see they were located based on uh, two of the anomalies that we found. Um, the results of the geophysical surveys and also our phase one analyses uh, resulted in the selection of uh, 14 proposed test well sites throughout the town. And uh, we proceeded with the next phases of work, three, four, and five, in which we drilled uh, several of the uh, exploratory test wells. Uh, we converted one of the test wells into a production well, NGE2B, and we uh, conducted preliminary testing to uh, determine, uh, to get a first look at what the uh, yield and water quality would be from the groundwater resources. This slide shows the um, the locations of the proposed wells within zones NGE 1 and 2. And um, these are located in the, s in the south central portion of town. Um, you can see there Grapevine Hill uh, Road and uh, Ash Swamp Road is the one that kind of goes from northwest west to southeast. And the yellow dots are the wells that we actually drilled. And as I indicated, NGE 1A and in the southern zone and NGE2B in the northeastern zone are the proposed production well sites. This is a uh, picture of the uh, air rotary rig that was used for the drilling. We actually had to bring a second uh, compressor on site because of the high yield of the wells. And uh, this just shows the method we we're using for uh, measuring the water uh, yield, the preliminary water yield. They evacuate the water out with air from the well, and then uh, we created that impoundment, and uh, we can determine the water uh, rate uh, as it flows through the weir that's shown there in the front of the picture. And this is about 350 gallons per minute flowing through there right now. Um, what, this is a, just table information on the wells, two wells, uh, production wells we're proposing. And I wanted to emphasize the yields that we uh, are going to, we anticipate from these wells. Uh, the NGE2B well was drilled first as an exploratory test well. It's the second line there. It's a six-inch diameter well. 
and the airlift yield at the end of that was 220 gallons a minute. We then reamed out the well to a larger diameter, just redrilled in the same well and enlarged it to eight inches, and the yield increased to 352 gallons per minute. And these are airlift yields that will have to be tested further through our, our next phases of work to determine a safe yield for the well. The NGA-1A well down at the bottom uh, was drilled as a six-inch diameter well. It's 135 gallons per minute. Um, our plan is to go back to that well this summer when the land dries out around it and uh, ream that out to a production well um, so that we can uh, hopefully get an increase in yield there as well. The, uh, we took this information from the first uh, five phases and uh, submitted it in a, uh, summarized it and submitted it in a preliminary hydrogeologic report to the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, NHDES. And that uh, report was the first uh, part, or first uh, step in a water withdrawal permit application for these wells. And that was submitted last April of 2008. And um, the um, work that we will be completing this summer, um, in the summer and the fall, will be the determination of the sustainable yield of the proposed production wells. And we'll be doing more uh, rigorous uh, water quality analyses on those wells. And the pumping test will incorporate a seven-day pumping test of both wells. They'll be uh, st the start of the test will be staggered by one day, and then they'll be pumped together for a seven-day time period, and that uh, creates a maximum stress on the aquifers in the region, so we can look at impacts. We'll be monitoring on and off-site wells, and also surface water locations. The, we'll be using automated date water level uh, recording equipment, like uh, Jeff uh, in the picture on the left is installing in a monitoring well. And we'll be monitoring um, probably upwards of 30 or so uh, domestic wells in the areas proximal, proximal to the uh, or surrounding the proposed production well sites. And uh, we haven't determined which locations we'll be doing yet. We'll be sending out uh, letters requesting permission to do that to everyone within 3,000 feet of each well. We'll also be installing some shallow piezometers. They're just monitoring locations, and they go into the wetland materials. So we will be using these to determine wetland impacts or potential wetland impacts. And uh, unfortunately, as part of this procedure, we had to apply for a major wetland dredge and fill permit. Um, we have done that, and we have permission. They approved the permit to proceed ahead with the installation. And we hope to do that in the next two or three weeks. We'll uh, compile all the data from the pumping test, all the water level, imp water level impacts and our analyses of those impacts, and we'll use that to determine the zone of contribution around the well, the area which is impacted by the pumping, and then that will lead to the uh, delineation of the wellhead protection area around that, which can be used in the future for educational materials to different uh, potential adverse impact or potential contaminant threats in the area. And then we'll also be looking at the uh, potential wetland impacts and, of course, determining the safe yield of the well from the, from the data that we collect. Once we've uh, completed our analyses, we'll submit a final hydrogeologic report to the DE DES for their approval. Uh, we hope that this will be completed in the um, fall of 2009 to the spring of next year. And uh, that report will lead to the approval of the proposed production wells for uh, water withdrawal permit. And uh, it may be that that will require a public hearing, although no one requested one for the preliminary report. So uh, I don't know that that will necessarily occur. Um, so that's, that's kind of the quick, quick look at the uh, bedrock exploration. And um, uh, I, I'd like to just move on to artificial recharge. And then if you don't mind, we can just answer questions about both of them at the end. Um, the next phase of work in uh, the artificial recharge study is uh, phase three. and is, um, Sean and Jamie were talking about this will be funded in part uh, by the ARRA money that uh, will be, um, that has, uh, we're in the first stage of the approval for that, I should say. And um, as Jamie mentioned, the reason that our official recharge is being considered here is because um, through the historic uh, records from the Sewell and Bennett wells has shown that the historic pumping at those sites has resulted in a lowering of the water table, the kind of the local regional water table around those wells by as much as 14 feet, which brought it dangerously close to the top of the screen within the Bennett well. And artificial recharge, the use of artificial recharge will be used to reverse this trend of lowering water levels It'll, and also to enhance the productivity of the production wells so that potentially um, 
we feel that a higher uh, pumping rate could be used or more water could be withdrawn from the wells. And the main uh, objective is here, as Jamie mentioned, water will be pumped from the Lamprey River during periods of high flow from uh, kind of late fall, winter, and spring from the Lamprey River and it'll be put into the, into the artificial recharge basin during that time. And then come uh, early summer, you stop the recharge and just continue pumping and the water that's built up will be uh, serve as recharge to the wells. This shows a, a topographic map of the site, uh, the location of the Bennett and the Sewell wells on either north and south side of Route uh, 152. Uh, New markets um, in the right-hand side of the map. And the Lamprey River is just to the west, um, on, in the western portion, right under the word Lee. Um, and that's the area where we anticipate that the intake will be for the recharge. The yellow line is the limits of the sand and gravel deposit that forms the New Market Plains Aquifer, and that's the, uh, the hydrologic unit that the wells obtain their water resources from. This just gives you a quick look of kind of a rough layout. The intake with location would be on the Lamprey River, as I mentioned on the west side or left side of this photograph. There will be a pipeline that will be laid uh, on the ground surface for the most part along the north side of Route 152. That will lead to a recharge basin that's shown in the um, aerial photograph uh, just to the southwest of the Bennett Well. Um, here's a, a, another view of that. The proposed artificial recharge site is uh, an old sand pit, uh, which the photograph shows on the right-hand side. It's uh, partially overgrown with vegetation right now, and that will eventually uh, be removed to some extent to create recharge basins within that area. We've already conducted several studies um, as part of our application for the groundwater discharge permit. One is to uh, get a rough estimate at the beginning of how much water you can add to a recharge basin at this location before basically it starts to pond on the surface. And so we conducted percolation testing in, uh, within pits or trenches within the gravel pit and uh, de determine how much water could be put in or get, had an estimate of that. We also wanted to get a feeling for how much natural filtration will occur when you add surface water to the aquifer. It'll run through the sands to the well, and those sands uh, are natural filtration media. And so we did some testing <coughs> over, um, over where George office, George's office is, and uh, we had some two uh, sand-filled, or two columns that are shown on the right-hand side here that are filled with sand from the site. And we uh, took water from the Lamprey River and uh, throughout the year and added that to the top of the column on the left and it flowed down through there and then we pumped it up on the right hand side and we uh, took uh, water samples before we put it in at the bottom of the first column and at the top of the last one and analyzed those for specific water quality uh, parameters such as color and dissolved organic compounds or uh, content and uh, the objective here was to see how much filtration would occur as we add it to the sand and the results of these uh, Preliminary studies show that the sediments at the proposed sites for the artificial recharge basin are very transmissive and uh, they will not be the limiting factor in determining the amount of artificial recharge used in the future. And also the natural filtration of the recharge water by the sediments in the aquifer will beneficially improve the water and the surface water, the quality of the surface water added to the artificial recharge basin such that by the time that reaches the production wells it will be uh, it will be of potable water quality. The, the next phase we did was developing a, a, a numerical model of the uh, aquifer, aquifer. And uh, we um, did that by initially by calibrating the model parameters that you can change uh, using a seven-year record of um, water, use rec water use record from the <laughs> Bennett and Sewell wells, so how much water was pumped from those wells each day, plus precipitation records for that time period. And that period of record goes from 2001 when there was drought to years after that when there was above average precipitation and then some years where there was average. So we, we were able to match each one of those conditions with our model. So we feel it's a rigorous model for different types of cli climatic conditions. And then we use that model once we calibrate it to ask questions, to simulate things. How much water can you add before water starts ponding on the surface? or how much, um, how much higher can you pump the wells before you draw it down too much? Those sort of questions. And one thing we tried was how much, um, what, how much would the water level rise in the aqu aquifer if we add 
uh, recharge for six months compared to if we don't add it. So if we just pump those wells for a year's time period, one, one simulation, we don't add any artificial recharge, and the other simulation, we add it for six months. What's the difference in the water table as a result of that? And uh, these show uh, water level contour maps. They're color contoured maps. Uh, the contour map in the upper left-hand corner is the simulation without any artificial recharge. And then in the bottom right is with artificial recharge. And there will be three slides just like this. And the, the red color, as you can see on the scale, is high elevations. It's 95 feet plus, And then the blue is 55 feet of elevation. So at the, at, the start of the, at the start of the test, the simulation started in November of 2001, which was a drought period. The water table at the Bennett Well was approximately 70 feet in both these models. It's just the starting, so it's static water level. But you can see in the bottom right that where the arrows are, are going out radially, that's an area, that's where the recharge basin, and they're starting to build up a mound there, and water's flowing away from it in all directions. And then at the end of the recharge season, after six months of adding uh, recharge at a rate of uh, 0.5 MGD per day, you can see here that the water table around the recharge basin is much higher. It's, it's above 90 feet, and the area of red, which is the high water table, is much more extensive in the model where we add recharge compared to the one uh, that recharge was not added. And the red in that is just from natural recharge, uh, precipitation, rain. And you can also see that the water level around the Bennett Well was 81 feet at the end of this recharge period compared to 70 feet without the recharge. So we've built up an extra 11 feet of potential recharge or water elevation that can be used during the dry period. And then at the, so at that point we turned off the artificial recharge in the model and natural rain stopped because it was drought. It's kind of a typical summer scenario where you have very little rain during the summer. You store it during the the early year and then, then uh, drain that storage. And so naturally the water levels in both models go down because you don't have any recharge. But it's interesting at the end, what's, what's important at the end is that the water level at the Bennett Well at the end of the modeling is 70 feet versus 65 feet where the recharge did not occur earlier in the year. So we've built up a surplus in the water table, in the water level throughout that area of five feet. And of course, then you start recharging the next year, and that five feet is, is preserved. You, add, you could potentially add in this model five feet each year as you build it up higher and higher. So again, it's a way that we're going to maintain a, a specific water level, a favorable water level within this aquifer. The sewer well is also benefiting. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, it's 55 feet where our recharge occurred versus 52 feet where recharge did not occur. So even though the recharge site is closer to the Bennett well, there is an uh, increase in water level elevation at the Sewell well. And then, you know, we asked some basic questions, or this helped us to answer a, a series of questions. Uh, one is, is um, uh, the ar artificial recharge that's applied at the Bennett, <laughs> Bennett site a benefit to the Sewell well? And uh, as I just indicated, yes, it is. Uh, there's a ratio of about 60%. So the, whatever the water level increases at the Bennett, 60% of that will occur at the sewer well. And um, will artificial recharge allow more water to be pumped from the New Market Plains aquifer on a regular basis? And the model suggests that indeed, yes. Um, and we anticipate a potential increase of the total productivity between the two wells, or for the for two wells, of 70% or around uh, uh, 350,000 uh, GPD, or 0.3 five million gallons per day. And right now the average pumping rate is about uh, 0.5 MGD. Um, so at the conclusion of phase two, we submitted a hydrogeologic report to the DES summarizing the results of our study. Uh, based on this, the groundwater discharge permit for the um, recharge, artificial recharge, was approved by the DES. And they also approved the um, proposed phase three work task uh, for further evaluation of artificial recharge. Um, again, our overview map here, um, the uh, task one um, of uh, the phase, <laughs> phase three is divided into a series of tasks. Task one uh, incorporates the work for the intake uh, location. And it would include the permitting and design and installation of uh, temporary Lamprey River water intake. 
And this would include such things as examining potential sites along that river segment that we're interested in, uh, the installing borings to evaluate the nature of the, um, the characteristics of the local sediments to see where the most transmissive areas are, for example. Evaluate and design intake, uh, the intake structure with provisions to protect against ice damage because this will go through a winter period. And uh, we'll have to obtain a wetland permit through the DES for the location and then um, inst finally install the temporary surface water intake in the Lamprey River. And we'll also have to design a, uh, a pumping test for this site. It's, it, it is just a temporary uh, pump house, so it'll be, we'll try to make it small in size and make it unobtrusive. Uh, it'll, but it will have to be insulated and heated to protect things from freezing during the winter time. And three-phase uh, power will have to be taken to the house to um, run the centrifugal pump that will pump the water out of the Lamprey River to the site. Uh, this shows George uh, um, looking at a centrifugal pump that's um, with the Dover system. They have an artificial recharge system that they use, just to give you an idea of the, the size of the um, equipment we're talking about. Um, and then if we look at task two, uh, things associated with the pipeline installation, as I mentioned for, before, this is um, what we envision for the pipeline. It'll be uh, a temporary pipeline run on top of the ground surface, except uh, where we intercept driveways between the Lamprey River and the uh, recharge basin. And on my way here tonight, I was counting them up. There are about 14 or so that we'll, uh, we'll have to go underneath. And you can see how they've uh, just trenched underneath the driveway, or underneath the road, in this case, at the upper corner there. And um, the design and installation of the pipeline will require engineering for those driveway crossings, uh, protection against freezing. The idea is if the pump turned, uh, turned off during the winter time, make it self-draining so that the water doesn't pond in the pipe and freeze before you can get it going again. Uh, we'll have to obtain some access easements from the DOT and probably one or two property owners and uh, planning for the uh, pipe drainage and the artificial recharge basin, just what that configuration is going to look like as it goes into the basin itself. And then the other uh, task three uh, involves the recharge basin itself. And this work will be um, include removing the uh, subsurface structure, which is uh, um, a pipeline basically of screens underneath the subsurface that was used for the 2002 and 2004 artificial recharge experiment and then the design and the construction of the recharge basin or basins. And these can be pretty simple. This is uh, the recharge basin that's used in Dover. It's a um, depression in a old sand pit. You can see the discharge line coming in uh, for the surface water. They, on, in the bottom right-hand corner, it's winter time. They've actually filled it up so much that it's ponded. And then as they pump that uh, through the year, the pond uh, gets lower and lower until the sand's exposed and the water level continues to lower beneath the ground surface. And uh, the bottom of the pit just needs to be uh, cleaned out every few years as the silt starts to gather from the surface water. It settles out at the surface, so you just scrape that off and rejuvenate the surface of those. Task four is um, the actual field pilot test. And uh, this is the actual uh, operation of the artificial recharge for one season. And it will include the pumping of lamprey water to the recharge basins and uh, no doubt the pumping rate will vary during the year as, as uh, we do as we find out how the aquifer responds. And uh, monitoring of water levels and observations will occur so that we can uh, incorporate that data into our model that we created before. And we'll also be monitoring uh, the Lamprey, Lamprey river, river water quality and the groundwater quality from the wells to see how much filtration is going on and make sure there aren't any issues there. And then that data will be used for recalibrating the groundwater flow model uh, more accurately so that it can be used for further simulations if needed. And that's, that's the uh, conclusion of, uh, of my summary about them. So if you have any questions, we'd be glad to address them. Thank you. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Just a phase three, which is the uh, the last bit that John reviewed. Uh, 
which includes the temporary pipeline and the temporary intake structure and things of that sort. I just want to make sure the council realizes that that is, we've gone through the modeling, everything looks good from the first part, but now we have to do the actual field pilot test to confirm that the modeling is correct and that it's actually going to work and there's no fatal flaws before you invest the money down the road uh, for the permanent pipeline. One thing I found out today in talking to the state is that there is a consideration being given for a second round of, of funding and <clears throat> that probably will come down another year from now. But I think this project has gotten a lot of attention at the state and, and the likelihood is, is, is possible that if you get to the next level that there's going to be money available to also help, I can't guarantee that, but to help on the next phase, which will be the permanent construction. So <clears throat> with that said, I, I, uh, if you have questions about the process, I, there's also, this is a new program, and uh, there is a, you're not guaranteed the money yet from AWR. <laughs> it's, there's always strings attached, it seems. We have to go through an environmental review. So the next step that we're going to be faced with is there are some forms that I've sent down to Ed and Sean that we need to fill out. One is an environmental form, and they send it out to an intergovernmental agency, which says they'll take our project, send it to Fish and Game, send it to bureau, uh, uh, a couple of bureaus within the DES, and they will all look at it and say, yes, it passes muster. I mean, they've already seen a lot of this, but they, they've got to go through this process. Then once the DES, and they have about 30 to 45 days to do that, once they say this is a good project, then it goes out for public comment for 30 days. At that time, uh, then we have to go through the forms of authorization to fund it, and, and then we can proceed. The dates are very important in this Reinvestment Act. The date, it, we need to move forward relatively quickly because the way that this, it's set up, their absolutely drop dead date is December of this year to have everything in order. But you got scored high because it was thought that it could be done sooner than that, maybe by, you know, in the next 60 days. I also did not realize that, and, uh, and this is something we probably need to discuss, is that if you choose to proceed with this project, your portion of it will be 311000 But you have to actually go to borrow the entire amount of which you send invoices to the state, and they will reimburse you all the way through to the 622000 which is what was the estimate. But you only have to pay them back 311000 the interim financing on that is 1.1% for the time period they use it. The five-year loan agreement, which is what, was, uh, what we had applied for, is at 1%. So it's a very attractive uh, lending rate, uh, but it is contingent upon the timing because the way this stimulus money is trying to be worked is it's trying to go through the system relatively fast. So I just want to give you a little bit of the hard nuts and bolts of it, too, because it's a uh, it's different than I really anticipated, and there's still a review process. So there's about 60 days that you have to go through. There's a still a possible fatal flaw that the state could come back and say no. But right now, you're rated number two. So uh, with that, I'll just let you ask some questions about. OK. Uh, Vice Chairman Bergeron? I got a bunch of little questions okay. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're also pursuing looking at other wells. Yeah. And if, if we do indeed get some other production wells going, that will give the existing wells a time to recharge and, and you know, we can kind of give them a rest. Correct. You're also dealing with the, uh, the other well study. So if we were to get one of those online, would this whole project be necessary? In your, do you feel, still see any real benefit? I'm sure there's some benefit, but. Yeah. Because we're, we're talking a, a temporary sure. installation, not a permanent installation, which is my later question of how much that <laughs> might cost. Yeah. It's a good question. It's a very good question. And I, and I think that the answer is, is, is one that probably needs some consideration in terms of long term. That I'm looking at, we're involved with a lot of these groundwater development projects and permitting in the state. Things are changing rapidly at the state in terms of legislation and how they're permitting water supplies. As you know, the Lamprey River in-stream flow rule issue has become a major task and a major effort and investigation made by the state and others to limit, so to speak, 
the amount of water that could be actually withdrawn from the Lamprey River and its watershed. Now, we're found, you know, our wells are in the Lamprey River watershed as well as the fact that we're talking about taking some water out of the Lamprey River in stream flow rules uh, in, uh, from the Lamprey River itself. It's clear in the discussions, and Sean and Ed, we've been involved in making comments to the in-stream flow rules, and it's been postponed for two years because enough people were concerned about how the process was going about not considering public water supply and protecting the rights for utilities to use water. Because ultimately, the way it's written right now, the, the, uh, the fish and certain other habitat, biohabitats, will have precedence over public water utilities for the development of additional supply. So I think that's what's going to happen is that you're going to see a very big change in your ability to develop additional sources. Now I don't want to scare you into saying that you may be restricted from the future, but I, there's no question in the last four years the difficulty of developing new sources is 100% more difficult today than it was four years ago. And I fully anticipate that four or five or six years down the road, when the Lamprey River in-stream flow rules take into effect, and the difficulty with the large groundwater withdrawal permitting process, which uh, is becoming more of a, a game of fodder back and forth between various concerned citizens groups and towns and utilities and commercial activities, that the allocation schemes for future water withdrawals is going to be more difficult. So there's an advantage to securing your long-term water supplies today, not necessarily spending the, you may not want to go ahead and spend the month, the big money, which will be, I think we estimated, the, you, you were leading, leading to it, the phase four right now, we had estimated about $3 million for the permanent installation of the line from the Lamprey to this system with the recharge basins and the, and the intakes, the permanent intake structure. You may postpone that for a long time. As long as you get, I think, as long as you get your foot in the door with a permit that says, look, we've gone through the process of finding the source, permitting the source, you get into the in-stream flow rule as an existing, you know, as an existing source. But they're going to have to recognize that you've invested capital funds to secure that. Possible right. so, so we are grandfathered in a way when we get that permit? You are, if you have a well, your Sewell and Bennett wells right now, even though they're in the Lamprey River watershed, are part of the equation for the allocation scheme coming down the road. It's already because you're dependent upon it. And if you put in your new source of supply, and that's one of the things we were waving arms at because you're not the only ones. There are other people trying to develop their water resources right now saying, wait a second, you've got to give some some uh, put some importance to future development of public water supplies, and the reality is, is that that's that was left out entirely in the Lamprey River in stream flows. There is no protection for public new public water supplies, or even to this end, it's not even a consideration as part of the write up. That may change because we've we've made a lot of complaints about it to get you guys involved, not just you, but Durham and other other folks who are um, uh, in, in the same boat. So if we're successful in the, in the groundwater development in the bedrock, that's going to diminish the need for you to put in the artificial recharge tomorrow. But if you don't have, if for some reason we hit a fatal flaw, and that's why we've been going at this it's, you know, kind of simultaneously, and there's still some, we, I mean, we're at the real key part now this summer testing these new wells. If there's some fatal flaw to that process, you've got the artificial recharge. The thing the artificial recharge doesn't do for you is give you duplicity in source. Because if you ever had a problem over there, whether we have artificial recharge or not, you don't have another source. Because that artificial recharge is not going to fix a contamination problem. It's not going to fix a ca catastrophic failure. In that act. So I, I, my suggestion and my thinking in this is that you've got this kind of came along as a surprise, the stimulus money. Uh, we you know, Sean put it in as, a, as an option. I think you got a, a, some free money that, that may allow you to get further along than you might have expected. And that gives you at least the point in time that you've fixed, you've got all your ducks in a row, you've got your easements, you've got your temporary <coughs> intake, you see if it works, and you've done your pilot test, you've got that egg in your basket, and we get to figure out if it actually is 350,000 gallons of additional capacity or not. If you decide to get that done and you get your final answers, you can put that in, secure it on the side, 
and you have this duplicity of source in your other source, or development of another source. So I think that from the standpoint of where we are now, it's still good to continue those parallel tracks. But I think you have a really good point that at that point, you may choose. That's a five-year project, or that's still somewhere down the road. I don't know. That's, that's certainly a reasonable tack. But I, I am concerned about these in-stream flows and, and how it will impact your ability to take water from the Lamprey River and to take water from the, the watershed. Your permission, can I? Oh, absolutely. Councilor Bottomen. Um, Jim asked some of the questions I was going to ask. Um, two questions. Um, the intake is in the town of Lee, mm -hmm. and are we currently negotiating with the town of Lee to or to withdraw water from <coughs> there? We've had some discussions with them. They are supportive of the town having the ability to remove water from the Lamprey at this point. Um, we haven't uh, identified, per se, where we were going to do it. We just wanted to know how willing they are and if there was going to be any cost. Because obviously it's within the town of Lee and they could potentially use the, the Lamprey River as, as a water source, although they don't ever anticipate they would do that. So we, our discussions have been that A, yes they are, and B, they would like to have some discussion with the town on how the two communities can work together in a mutually beneficial way for us to remove water um, and uh, through, through their allowance and for us to maybe partner with them on a project that would be of importance to them. Okay. And a good part of that too, and it's a, a part of that question, if those negotiations with Lee completely fail or we see that there's no progress, then you don't spend any more money on it. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's kind of the key component to get that agreement and that and the easements and all the things that we need to do to run that temporary pipeline across. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and the second question I had was, um, assuming that everything works out and that there is a decision made to go forward with a permanent recharge, uh, you had mentioned the cost of roughly $3 million to do that. Sean, what, do, what effect does that have on the rate payers? Have we done any analysis on the wells and the recharge, what impact it's going to have on rates? I know you're doing a rate study that's been ongoing. Does it incorporate all this stuff in it? Ed and I spoke earlier that we really need to sit down and look at the projects in the water department and pick and choose and try and figure out what the schedule is. doesn't mean that we, we do all at once. We try and come up with a schedule that would fit new market and fit the, what's best for the water department. So rates wouldn't see this major, major effect on them. Right, but I guess my question is just that no matter what project it is, whether it's this or the water line, the new tank, whatever, um, is there analysis done to find out what the impact is on rates before we go forward too far? Right. Do we have, do we have these numbers anywhere? Are they, have they been done yet? Right now, right now, if we move forward with this project, the money would be used out of CIP capital reserve. If right. we move forward right. and then nothing would be done we'd have to look at the three projects that actually are on the water tank, the groundwater, and um, the recharge. Uh, right now with loans, you're talking about $70,000 per million on a loan right now. Right. And I know we're retiring some debt. Um, we, uh, we've been putting a lot of money into capital reserve. So Ed and I had a lot of discussions earlier, and we need to sit down and evaluate that. Um, that's not, yeah, no, we're not trying to, we're not trying to stick our foot out there too far. Oh, no, I understand that. I just think that any of, any decision we make on any of these things needs to be, that needs to be part of the equation, what, what the effect yes. is on rate payers. Yes, yeah. yes. Oh, that's huge. That's, huge. there's no question on that. I will tell you, back in the, um, in the uh, late 90s when we had the drought, um, the, the sewer well screen, the depth to screen, you know, is, is uh, around 68 feet. And um, we had to keep lowering the low water cutoff, the well sh automatically shutting off. And we were down about one foot from the screen. We were about one foot away of having no water from that well. So I, I, it's, it's important that we, st that we not only we make good decisions, but we need to try and Absolutely. move along on this. It's important. All set. Um, before I go to the vice chair again, any other councillors have anything? Yes. 
Councilor um, Clark. Is, is the, uh, the, the two new preliminary new wells, are they in the uh, aquifer plains as de delineated by Dufresne's Henry study? No, these are no. separate, ac this is a separate aquifer altogether. It's a separate aquifer yeah, one, the, the New Market Plains aquifer is actually sand and gravel mm -hmm. aquifer, and the wells that we're putting in are bedrock wells. Bedrock wells. Yeah. Are there any active gravel pits near these wells? No. No. And with bedrock wells, do you have a higher incidence of arsenic or radon that would have to be treated usually, or? Uh, well, there are areas that we that, that do have high ar arsenic. We have uh, done some preliminary testing on the wells today, and the water quality has been excellent. But that's one of the reasons why I got to get through the testing this summer to find out when we put a real stress on it during a low flow condition, <coughs> do we see changes in the quality of the water? Um, and, and that would could be and could dictate a fatal flaw to the process. And if we didn't get permission from Lee for the recharge, could we use one of these wells here for recharge? Um, it wouldn't be feasible. Yeah, probably not feasible, yeah, in terms of the distance and the cost and so forth. And would the cost of connecting these wells to our water supply equal the same amount that we would spend for a temporary recharge system? That cost has not, because we haven't gotten through the final negotiations with the landowners, the costs haven't been, those costs of the interconnects have not been put together yet. Um, and I think, the, the, in all honesty, the intent was once you determine if, if the artificial recharge is a definite go, a possibility and the, the groundwater can be permitted with a groundwater withdrawal permit, you've got an X capital cost to hook up for the next one, which we know is about $3 million for the artificial recharge. And then you've got whatever it is, $1 million or whatever it is for the, for the groundwater. You make that decision as to which it's going to be. I don't know what the, we haven't. We haven't put together any numbers for the interconnect for the groundwater system, but they're pretty close to the existing distribution system. What's the distance, John? Do you know? Well, the uh, what's the Macintosh well? Is that about 1,500 feet or yeah, well, something like that? Yep. And then exactly. the Tucker well is another 2,500. The Tucker well is a lot. That's the crow farther. flies. It was a lot farther. <laughs> yeah, if you have to follow the road. It's a lot farther. And if from perspective, the artificial recharge is about 6,800 feet. So. Uh, 6,700 feet. So you know that the distance is, is you know, longer for the artificial recharge. Thank you. So, so don't take my million dollars as a number because I don't know. I'm just, but I just know it's going to be, should be less expensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Vice Chairman Bergeron. Uh, just a couple of little bits and pieces here. Sure. Um, one thing that Eric had mentioned, also we have to worry about the rate study for the, the future yep. um, proposed sewer plant upgrades which could be significant which which just by the way we have a meeting tomorrow to go over the, the first sort of round of, of what we're seeing and, and what the rate impact would be right oh that was just that wasn't even a question really <laughs> <laughs> um, is there three phase available on that road being a little quiet country road I don't know if there is uh, there's three phase at the wells right now okay good um, this is being done in Dover right now? Yes. How successful has that been? How long have they been doing it? They've been doing it for quite a few years. years. Quite yeah. a few years. And where are they pumping from? Um, the eyes and glass. The eyes and glass, yeah. They had two locations at first, and I think they're down to one location now. Um, well, one was an uh, ongoing sand pit, and they're yes. using the processing water as their recharge source, and yeah. then the sand pit operation, I guess, is going to be uh, closing Terminated. Down. I can't remember the numbers, but they saw a substantial increase in production at their well mm -hmm. uh, instantaneously when they started to pump. And just one other thing. Um, how are we going to keep this temporary line from freezing in the middle of the winter? Got to pump it. 700 feet. <laughs> you gotta yeah. run it. Just you keep it continuing. Yeah, you got to keep running it. Like yeah. a backup generator just in case we lose power. Yeah, and we're talking about drainage. So have an emergency drain because otherwise it would be, be a major mess. I guess it will be designed so that it doesn't develop airlocks and the water can just flow out flow at the ends. So. Right. Thanks. That's it. Councilor Bonneman? Yeah. I have two other questions, I guess. On Assuming that the um, recharge were to be successful, um, is a recharge basin considered a wellhead for wellhead protection radius? Do you do you develop a protection radius around that? If do you need to? No. Uh, what the interesting thing with the model, though, is we've been able to define the. I mean, we showed you a very, very basic 
thing tonight, but we have the groundwater flow network from the injection on this model based on seven years of actual data and calibrated, so we know where the groundwater is moving. Uh, <clears throat> you're not capturing at all. Right. You won't capture all that groundwater. Some of it is going to go off to a wetland, some of it is going to go into a spring, but you're going to capture enough to, to make a, a positive benefit. So we have a very good handle, and ultimately the result will be to put a wellhead <coughs> protection yeah, uh, uh, around, the, uh, around those wells. And we'll be using that modeling data uh, to do so, and the pilot testing as well. I mean, is that all on town of New Market property now? Or would that? Yes. That, that, doesn't, yes. that wouldn't infringe on private property at this point? No. No, no not no. anticipated. No. Okay. And the last question I have is wetlands with recharge. The other towns that have been successful in recharging, do they see an increase in wetlands and surrounding properties or there is hasn't, that a byproduct there, of this? There hasn't been a very good study on that. And uh, this will actually be the most comprehensive artificial recharge study done in the state. They kind of just threw a pipe in the ground, had a gravel pit, started <coughs> pumping water out, and, and lo and behold, they had a benefit. Um, <laughs> that's basically that what happened. That, that's something that we're going to be looking at, though, as part of our study yeah. in some yes. yeah. some, of, way. some of the modeling suggests that the uh, historic springs that have really got, frankly dried up when you started sure. the, uh, pumping the existing wells, they may start flowing again to some extent during some times of the year. Because like Jamie said, we don't we don't capture all the water, but the natural drainage will go out right. to exi existing streams or wetlands. Thank you. And that's why the state likes it so much. Yeah. That's yeah. why the state likes mm. it so much. Why because they? Because it's going to help the wetlands restore the wetlands back to their natural. Yeah. Yeah, but if I look at it the other way, if you own property and you end up with New wetlands, wetlands well, now, no, no, yeah. no, no, it's um, not. It's not a good it's, thing. They're already wet. <laughs> yeah. They're already wet. <laughs> yeah. so it's just, it's just going to just going to become more wet. Yeah, it's just that's, gonna, that's what I'm asking. Okay. They're going to bring them back to the <laughs> natural. Suddenly, state. I can't yeah. live in my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Some of the water may eventually drain back into the Lamprey River, actually. Yeah, and that's the what they're looking at. Yeah. 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 Councilor Council? Done. Thank you. Councilor Minitelli. <coughs> hmm? Motion. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion to accept the, uh, the ARRA funds in the amount of $622,000 for field testing for the artificial recharge for Market Plains Aquifer. Second. Discussion? Um, Town Administrator? Uh, I was just going to uh, add what, what John just said, that uh, I, Peter Garrett, when he was here, made mention of the fact that uh, the water that we would be putting on to the Bennett Well would naturally find its way back to the Lamprey River. So there's a beneficial effect for, you know, the town removing it at one spot, filling our well, and then also then, you know, the whole area back towards the lamprey on the other side gets filled back in that direction. So it's really a win-win situation when you look at it. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I'll ask for the vote. Councilor Carr? Aye. Councilman Utelli? Aye. Council Bodeman? Aye. Council Cox? Aye. Council Dickens? Aye. Council Bergeron? Aye. Chairman LeBranch? Aye. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Uh, just one point of clarification. I, do we need to go to a special town meeting? Yes. Okay. And I'll, we'll and begin that, that process that right away. Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay. Can we Don't hesitate if any of the workshop? council members mm -hmm. have questions go ahead to email and start us. The process. Uh, I'll, I'll start later. the process and give you all yeah. the okay. for this week as to timeline. Great. Thank you. Trying to see behind my head. Get out of there. <laughs> there we go. Oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Next is item number four, um, which actually I believe was was taken care of during public comment. So, does anyone see it, see a need to have this read, or are we all good with it? Yep. Oh, all set. Okay, moving on to item number five. Former town councilors request for reimbursement for copies and certified mailing of town administrator's evaluation. Uh, uh, town administrator, did you want to speak in this regard? 
Um, if I may, I just, sure. I guess I just, uh, I just want to take a few minutes to address the council um, relative to what was called the wrap up of the 90 day review of the town administrator that became the subject of discussion during the first week of May. The council identified uh, eight items that they wished for me to improve upon and that they would revisit that in April. Uh, these items resulted from the performance evaluation that was taken at the end of last year. On April 29th, I was made aware that the council would be discussing uh, these items on the May 4th agenda, which was a non-public meeting. And I had sent the then chair, Dana Glennon, as I did to all the councilors that had any email and, and to Council Quox, um, indicating that I would be present and would like the meeting to be public under RSA 91A colon 3 Roman 2A, which provides that if an employee requests that a meeting be open, the request to open the meeting shall be granted. On the meeting, uh, on the 4th, the council opened the meeting and a motion was made that was not to go into public session, but rather that the council would provide the chair and vice chair with their opinion and the chair as, as to the my success in achieving uh, those items. Um, and would provide it to the chair and vice chair, um, would receive them. Uh, and uh, at the end of that meeting, uh, the motion was passed and the council adjourned. I did, not, um, I did not meet with the chair and vice chair to receive the results of that meeting, uh, primarily because the entire council had no knowledge of the input provided by each member nor did the council as a whole have the opportunity to discuss the results that were submitted. I indicated to the chair that I would not meet with him and the vice chair, but suggested that he drop off the evaluation and I would review it. Uh, in short, I did, I did review it. And frankly, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask that this council dismiss this evaluation and that we return to the process outlined in section 4.3 of the town council that states, on a one year after the initial appointment and annually thereafter, the administrator shall be reviewed by the council. As part of this review, the council administrator shall mutually agree in writing to agreed goals and objectives for the town and the administrator for the coming year, review the extent to which the administrator has succeeded in meeting the goals and objectives for the preceding year, and determine the reasons why any of those goals were changed or not met during the year, end quote. This is something that has not happened here. Um, and uh, frankly, having received my evaluation uh, by certified mail return receipt requested, uh, I found somewhat offensive when that was not something that needed to be done, which the chair uh, took upon himself uh, to do. Um, in addition to the fact of of then going to Staples, from my understanding, and making copies for all the rest of the counselors to receive a copy of the evaluation and the supporting documentation. Um, and then presenting to the town a request for reimbursement of $13.86. Uh, and hence that comes forward because I think that any of these things could have been done um, here at the town office. Uh, he could have asked for the copier to be um, turned on and he could have made the copies and thereby saved the town funds and handed me the evaluation um, at this point. So I, I, I guess after reviewing it, I was disappointed with the, uh, what I read. Um, I didn't think it was fairly balanced. And primarily I was concerned that the council as a whole didn't have the opportunity to see it. Um, and those are things that uh, I find that uh, I've tried to, and various times and even in my earlier evaluation, a willingness to meet with the council to talk with them uh, and that was something that didn't happen and uh, I understand it's what happened in the past but um, I think there's time to change things and so I have nothing further to say at this point okay um, councilors any comments or motions or how would the council like to proceed with this Councilor Quox. Um, I, I just, I think this whole matter of, of not uh, giving the farm a chair $13.86 and bringing it to the council's attention to me was like 
I discussed with Mr. Winowski on the phone the other day was unnecessary. Um, uh, the, you have to remember that there was a vote for the uh, town administrator to meet with the chair and vice chair, and he refused to do that. Um, so the, the only recourse to make sure that he got the information from the chair and vice chair was through certified. And I mean, basically refusing to do what the council asked him to do, in my mind, is insubordination. He was, he was asked to do something, and he did not do it. That would be equivalent to Mr. Winowski um, asking a department head to meet with him for his evaluation, and him just, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Mail it to me. You don't do that. I'm sure Mr. Winowski wouldn't allow a department head to do that. And that is what he did with the town council's. Uh, vote. So to bring this up to, at this point, $13.86 because he's not happy the way the former chair made copies and mailed it to him, to me, is childish and immature and a waste of our time. And I'll let someone else speak if they have anything to say because I do have more to say. But. Um, Councilor Bottom. Um, I obviously can't speak to what happened during the review process, you know, previously. Um, I did receive the package, obviously. Um, I read it. It looked to me like there's a, a lot of, um, I guess, dissension among the council about whether goals were met or not met. Um, I think we probably have to develop a better way to handle that. Um, and as to the $13.86, I believe it could have been done differently, but um, I don't think we need to talk about that. I think we should just cut them a check and move on. Any other councilors? Uh, Councilor Carr. Um, I still, when this all came to pass, I said I thought that um, reviews should be done in private to start with. If after a review, Mr. Winowski or anyone else wants to publicize or make totally public whatever anyone said, that's fine. But if we can't sit together as a council and discuss how we feel about an employee, um, I, I just don't think that, that, I think that puts um, an extra burden on counselors to not be able to freely say what they feel. Um, if, if we could work out something where we could have a non-public discuss it and then we would all, if, if Mr. Wanowski wanted to have um, his review then given to him by the whole council, I don't particularly have a problem with that. But I still think that, that to discuss any employee with the employee sitting there, um, you know, what if what if there was something terribly wrong, and um, how would we then approach it? I'm not saying there is anything terribly wrong, but I'm saying if there was, um, how would you go ahead approaching it? Councilor Council, uh, Councilor Dickens. Obviously, I wasn't here for. Um, that time, just like Councilor Waterman. But as as an elected official, the hardest part, though, is sometimes you have to speak up in front of the group and say things. And I know personally, after reading the review, it, it's in, it would be interesting to see which counselors had different comments. And the public owe we owe that to them, so that they know what decisions we make. And if we want to stay non-public. That's that's the councilor's. I mean, the uh, Mr. Manowski's choice as to whether or not it's public or non-public. And the minute he wants it to be public, I think as a council we'd have that obligation to say how we feel specifically because it gives the public that choice to say, "Wow, I, I agree or I totally disagree with that person." It, we have to be held accountable. And when a review comes forward and people disagree in it, but only two people have the final say as what goes forward in that review, 
you take the power away from the whole group as a whole. Um, so I, I, I just think <coughs> moving forward that if Mr. Winowski wants it to be an open discussion as to whether or not we feel he met his goals, then I, I believe that we, sh we owe him that right because he, per RSA, has, he pointed out that he has that right. So that's all. Um, I, I think before we go any further, um, we'll, I'd like to maybe reel this in a little bit, and I think the actual issue is um, reimbursement or not. So um, to some extent, I, I guess if we can stay on that specific topic, um, it might be in the Council's best interest, and if we want to discuss the other issues later, um, that could also be arranged. Uh, Councilor Minitelli? Yeah, I was going to appreciate you pointing that out because I was going to say the same thing. Although I do agree with some of the points that were you know, <coughs> made, I think it's, you know, there's no, there's no debating that a, a public employee, uh, you know, if the council is going to go into non-public session about the employee and the employee wants uh, a public hearing, I, I understand people's opinions and, and, you know, when they say, I don't personally feel that that should be made public. But the reality is that the st that's a statutory right, um, and I you know I think that if that's not that's not really debatable, and if that's not something that people understand, you know I think that the council as a whole could benefit from some training from LGC or something, uh, and and frankly you know I might even recommend to the town administrator, you know that 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 be something you know with respect to, to doing a in a town administrator evaluation. I know LGC has some. You know some programs that they um, make available to selectmen in various uh, various communities, and you know I th certainly think this this council would benefit from from an educational experience like that. So um, if if that was something that you were to check into, I would support that. But uh, I'd just recommend moving on. There's no no motion on the floor. We got other things on the agenda here. Um. Councillor Carr, is this in regard to the reimbursement? No. Uh, no. Um, Councillor Bergeron, Vice Chair Bergeron, is this in regards to the reimbursement? It is. Okay. May I make a motion? Certainly. I'd like to make a motion to pay the former council chairman the monies owed to him for the postal reimbursement for the review. $13.86. The sum to be $13.86. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Only that I, I once again I agree it wasn't necessary, but I think fifteen dollars will just call it good and be done with it. No other discussion. I'll call for the vote. Y you're not. Your light's not on, is it? It's on over here. Okay, it is, I'm sorry, it's, it's not on over here. Yes. Just one last thing I want to say. I, I can understand why this came here because I sat at a council meeting as a member of the public when the council suggested that Mr. Winowski repay money for a phone call or something he had made to um, the legal council. So, I mean, I can understand the the dissension that was uh, with the previous council, but um, it's time to move forward. Let's pay it and move on. Any other discussion? And I apologize, I did not. Your light's not working over here. Councilor Quarks, did I'm all set. you're all set. Nothing else. I'll call for the vote. Councilor Carr, aye. Councilor Jelly, nay. Councilor Bodeman, aye. Councilor Quarks, aye. Councilor Dicklin, nay. Councilor Bergeron, aye. Chairman LaBranch, nay. Um, motion passes 4 3. Next on the agenda, old business. Does anyone have any old business to discuss? Uh, Council Minitelli. At our May 20, I, uh, our previous meeting, I think it was May 20th, where we adopted the rules uh, procedure, mm -hmm. and I was going to recommend uh, to the administrator that, that those rules be placed, if they're not already, be placed on the town website so that the public can have some access to, I mean, a lot of times we pass rules that I think, you know, we make reference to. We have the documents in our, our packet, but it's not necessarily meaningful discussion to 
people who are watching because they don't have access to those documents. So I think it would be helpful to, to perhaps have that, that particular document on the town website. Okay. Anyone else for old business? Um, I had one. Yes, Council Quas. Um, I was just wondering when was the last time that uh, Council uh, that uh, Town Administrator Wanowski did talk to Lee regarding the water. I think we had uh, initial discussion, uh, Mr. Glennon and I, back in February, and then we didn't have anything because we were looking at the point. In time of the negotiations that we're having on uh, that we've currently had on the well site itself and so we just stop having any further discussion so it's just a matter of calling them up and um, having a meeting with them but, but knowing that Emery and Garrett is working on this proposal for DES for withdrawal and so forth and so on and you mentioned that Lee did have um, a, a project request that we could do for re reciprocal uh, use for the water um, from February, I mean, you're, you're talking almost four months that, that basically I feel that something should have been done to that point just I, to, to, keep, to keep it alive and, and let them know that we're still interested. I, I don't think it was ever put out there by the council that we weren't still interested. I, I think the council's thoughts throughout this was with the potential uh, situation with with the wells being developed and and things of that nature um, that perhaps a recharge would take a back seat and this actually has really come to light in recent weeks understanding that we potentially are <coughs> going to get subsidized for this so I think that's why this has really kind of been brought back to the forefront as opposed to um, I, I don't think it was just neglected I, th I I can sit here and tell you honestly that from my perspective as a counselor that wasn't one of my prime focuses. My pr focus was to, to see if we could secure the well situation um, as, as a number one choice. Um, and, and I think to some extent, and I may be wrong, councilors that have been here, I, I don't think that the recharge was really something that we were that s strong about um, as far as getting specific answers and, and working arrangements and, and things like that. So, you know. I, I just would like to make that clear. I, I don't think we've just said, oh, you know, we don't need to discuss this. I think it was more of, you know, first of all, we've, we've had a change in the council. Um, we've received this stimulus funding uh, package possibly. So, you know, um, that's why it's kind of on the front burner now as opposed to being on the back burner. And, you know, any other councilors, please, or town administrator, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <coughs> I, I just thought it would be good PR to, to keep the communications open in case we did decide to go that route. I don't think they ever really were, were stopped. I think it was, you know, and, and actually the town administrator does have his light on, so maybe. And, and, and just to clarify that the paperwork that I gave you for, you know, the section of the meeting we just concluded, on 429, May 29th, was when uh, Sean Gregg filed the paperwork with DES because they called him up and said, look, we're very, very interested from our perspective on this project. Get the paperwork into us because the deadline was May 4th. So he put this through, and that's when we began having the discussion of let's get Emmy and Garrett in here and see if the council was willing to support, which means we would have to go back to uh, a special town meeting because the legislature provided us the opportunity if there was, we, we, can, we, met, we didn't meet the deadline uh, initially for many of the communities that had the May meeting, uh, March meetings. So it, it wasn't, you know, it was something that we, it became fast-tracked all of a sudden when it was an opportunity and it felt it was important to lay it before the council. The, again, the issue with, with Lee is there. I mean, they have a, a project they're looking for. Um, we talked with them a little bit and when, again, when the discussions started to sort of heat up relative to the well itself, at that point in time, we sort of pushed it back. I remember the uh, mm -hmm. Council of Branch saying at when we were having an open public, you know, let's push the the recharge back a little bit because if this is successful, then this is a, a a a really big resource for the community. In addition to the fact that we have the opportunity to put in a, a tower, also. In uh, another question, I was wondering uh, where are we with the RFP for the generator for the uh, rec department? That's being that's been put together, and we just have a clarification because we're having some 
you know, there was the diesel versus propane um, that we were having, mm -hmm. and we also needed to get an idea. Uh, in fact, I asked uh, Ms. Glover to talk with uh, uh, Mr. Bergeron relative to the switcher, the switch that we needed to transfer, okay. which would be the best that we should go for. So, so how far are we away from the RFP for that? Probably fairly soon, be able to get it out in about a week or so. Okay. But also, I just sent over to uh, to Julie Glover today that uh, uh, Homeland Security is making funds available for the purchase of a generator, so we might be able to get something through them. All right. And also, um, I, I when was McNeil Taylor informed that they were, after 28 years, that they were no longer are, um, are legal? I, from what I understand, uh, FX found out in the newspaper. My understanding, yeah. He, he, so you never called him, them to inform them. I did call them. Okay, but he he stated he found out in yep. the newspaper. Correct. So he found out in the newspaper prior to you calling him. Correct. Okay. Which, um, because they found out, I believe it was May twelfth. Uh, FX sent a, uh, an email, and uh, the, the, he's, he, we understand from the Exeter newsletter that the town has decided to utilize Upton and Hatfield as its general legal counsel, and so forth and so on. But um, I think it might have been nice after 28 years that they were informed before they read about it in the newspaper. I agree. I also had a long conversation with uh, Malcolm McNeil. <coughs> I think it should also be noted that uh, the vote was taken on a Wednesday evening, and that paper gets out, um, some of it gets out as early as Thursday online. So um, it could have very easily been read that way also. Um, but, um, you know, just to make that a point. Um, any other counselors? Oh, um, I do have a question. Could you just make sure the rules of procedure, a clean set, is also given to all of the counselors? Yes. So that they can have it? Yep. Okay. Um, anything else for old business? New business. Uh, Councilor Bottomen. Um, I don't know what the right approach is for this, but um, I know I've mentioned it previously. Um, budget season is going to be on us very quickly. I'd like to have uh, the town administrator and, and Don Parnell maybe figure out how we can expedite the town portion of the budget to coincide with the school so we, the budget committee can do them together so we have one an understanding, a comprehensive understanding of what the town costs are going to be for a year. So I don't know, you know what that's going to entail, but maybe at some future meeting we could get... <coughs> Dawn in here and figure out, see if he can get it done or not. But one of the things you have to remember is that <coughs> the charter specifies the procedure for presenting the budgets to the council. And by December 15th, it's my responsibility as a town administrator to present the council with the budget. Um, you know, I, right. I, I understand uh, the value of trying to do the two budgets together, um, but you know, generally ours takes a little bit longer, although it takes a long time to do the school budget. But the, the charter says what the deadlines are for that. If, if I might, I've, I've also had a brief discussion, um, actually yesterday, I believe it was, or two days ago, um, with the uh, chairman of the school board, um, trying to set up some kind of a um, <coughs> situation where the council and the school board can get together on maybe a workshop basis something like that and that's something that we can obviously discuss as a group um, it's my hope that tomorrow evening councillor vice chair Bergeron will be able to go to the school board meeting and just let them know what our thoughts are as opposed to us having to actually send a council rep to the school board so there is a potential that you know even though they won't be exactly the same time by the time you go to vote on the school budget, you should know what's going on with the municipal budget, I think. So, you know, but that is something that we can definitely talk as a group on when we do meet. So, uh, this year we tried to expedite the process, which I thought yes. fairly successfully in bringing the budget committee and the council together to hear from the department right. head once. 
Right. I, I mean, I think it worked very well. Yeah. The only, I think the issue we had at, as a budget committee was that the school budget is done mm -hmm. when you start looking at the town budget. And, you know, if you're looking to save money, you're ending up cutting from the town to cutting from the town things you don't cut from the school whereas I think it's more fair for everybody if you look at it in one fell swoop and treat everybody equally right you know so that's all I'll say that's fine okay. uh, vice chair Bergeron Correct. did you have more to add um, I think everybody's noticed that the trees have been planted downtown and uh, I think uh, a discussion with a uh, with, uh, Mr. Wanowski and Mr. Uh, LaBranch the other day about the quality of the trees and the quality of the plantings. I guess there's been some concerns, um, and we are addressing those. Um, though the trees look fairly healthy, there are some concerns about the way they were planted, and uh, some of the specimens aren't um, perfect by any means. So uh, we will be addressing that. Just want to let people know that. And also, uh, a woman from the state of New Hampshire, uh, Mary Reynolds, came in, and uh, she's an expert on uh, street scape trees and uh, had some concerns as well about how they were planted. So uh, we, are, uh, we are aware of that, and we'll be uh, looking at that. Um, the other thing is in regard to uh, Larry Pickering. Uh, he had mentioned the number of uh, lights in the downtown. Um, I was wondering came to me why we couldn't turn every one other one off perhaps I mean this would require a little bit of rewiring but if we could have wire it in such a way that every other one goes off at a certain time at night perhaps so you know during the the, the more used part of the evening the downtown could be well lit mm -hmm. and then maybe later on in the night we could you know dim half of them perhaps maybe that would be a cost savings of course that would require a little change to the infrastructure you know you'd have to change the way the circuits are arranged and add some timers and such but you know if that would pay for itself in a certain time frame you know that might be an, an option we'll, we'll we'll look into that we'll I'll talk with uh, the gentleman that we use for the uh, uh, for electrical to see if that's something that we can do but if, if I may piggyback on something um, I, I had a conversation this week with uh, with Rick Malaski in fact it was we had one yesterday downtown and again in my office today <coughs> he has made since last year the lights went in the new lighting went in a, a request to PSNH to remove the old lights that are downtown and he had called as late as Monday and said how come I still have lights and they are just not responding to it I think everybody knows that we are having a little tete-a-tete, -tete, so to speak, with PSNH. Uh, I'm meeting with the, um, the senior vice president tomorrow relative to the project, and that's something I'll bring up. But um, Rick Mulaski has been on them, you know, at least every month asking them why that those lights are not down uh, in the first instance. Secondly, um, I had a telephone call from a gentleman who lives in uh, uh, Nottingham who saw the new lights when he was coming through town and they works for GE Sylvania and says I think I can save you some money on some new lamps to go in there um, I just haven't had an opportunity to, to give him a call and have him come in but that's something we'll look at at this point but you know work but there there has been a request and I'm really surprised to hear that PSNH says we don't have a requesting because Mr. Malaski has put it in already on several occasions thank you Councilor Dickens, did you have something? No. Okay. Council Bottom, and I've got your light on. Is that from the last time? Yep. It worked. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Council Quox, did you have something? Yes. Um, getting back to the budget procedure, it was that Council Bottom requested. Uh, the administrator said we have to have it ready by December 15th. No, I, it is my responsibility to have the budget to the council by December 15th. I present the budget by December 15th, and then the council goes and begins their process. It says here a budget procedure no later than January 15th in the town charter. Budget procedure. I usually, but anyway, I usually have it to the council by December 15th. It's but, but that's not a date that you have to have it by. That's section 5.2 with budget procedure. <coughs> um, 
could you you could get it done earlier I mean that's not the date you have right. to have it done you could get it done earlier to coincide with the recommendation by mr. Vaterman for to, to coordinate with the school right. budget. as long as as long as everybody understands that there are certain numbers <coughs> from different vendors that tend to come in later in the year because you know we're an optional fiscal year same thing with the school has that type of a deal they they are July to June just as new markets are July to June fiscal the town side mm -hmm. there you know there is a, our health costs and things begin later in in January and early February is when so they start sending us notices so as long as everybody understands that the numbers they're looking at are not going to be hard fast numbers because there's still some vacant areas there and when does the school budget finish with their budget they're, they're they're ready for the March meeting so generally I think the budget committee f completes the budget at the latest in February February 15th yeah. yeah all right okay it but I did okay that's the budget um, the park bench is downtown I hear there some are la la lagged down and some but we've had missing. we've had one that grew feet and walked away was it not lagged down Correct. why were they put out there and not being lagged down the benches would take four of us to pick up it took four people four guys from the town crew to pick them up and put them into the back the, if you haven't tried to pick up a bench and I tried picking up the bench and I've tried to pick up the or at least move the trash containers they weigh about 300 pounds well I know the trash containers are heavy but those benches are just that composite no. with the right hand it, sides they're, no they're, they're very heavy items and they were put down downtown, and somebody's walked off with one. Well, we better keep downtown lit, so we can see. <laughs> Are the other ones going to be removed or flagged <laughs> down ASAP? We we haven't. You know, part of the, the thing that we're looking at is that uh, um, if we lag them down, we're going to have to deal with the fact that you know we have to make sure there's no obstruction. So when we're plowing snow in the winter time, we're not you know damaging the, the sidewalk and stuff so it's something we're looking at but we really haven't gotten to the point of talking about that um, you know we're just trying to a locate where this one went to but I mean they're fairly heavy items not heavy enough though yeah yeah I'm, I'm, you, know, you, you get four linebackers and they'll pick it up <coughs> Probably two of them will pick it up. It's the council manager. I'd just like to add that uh, Erica did ask if she could leave at nine o'clock, so she's Good night. being excused. Good night, Erica. Good night, Erica. Good night. So please speak into your microphone so she can get the rest off the DVD. And um, the I, I understood it was mentioned a few meetings ago that there is an existing ordinance that we already had in place regarding tables and chairs on the sidewalks. Yep. And um, they're supposed to be within so many feet of the front of the building. Correct. Down there. Now we have a they're, business they're, can be located in the front of the building the front of the building but not to block uh, because there is a business downtown that has a couple of tables and chairs that are right at the curb uh, which is a safety issue and I don't know if it's in compliance with that ordinance the the ordinance provides for an unobstructed travel lane mm -hmm. through there and yes there is one business that has two two tables that are over by the curb itself but not so far that they would get injured by the uh, they're right at the curb if, if a car jumps that granite curb someone sitting in those chairs are going to be hurt and they're, they're they're almost in the street I I haven't I haven't seen them in the street as, as you say I've, I've seen them down there but I haven't seen them that close the, the chairs are right on the curb and I, I probably have this the police chief look at it or the safety committee look at it because it is and and I don't know if it's in compliance with the ordinance that's regards councilor Quox might I suggest that we make that um, a topic for our workshop sure on the 17th mm -hmm. um, and you know if if you can be specific with where the location is and stuff so that maybe we can councils can go and check it out it's beforehand. The big, it's the big bean. and and um, you know then we can Holy discuss shit. it right. and make yeah. sure that all the all the councilors know and we can actually make sure that the ordinance gets enforced how's that do we Sounds want to add great. it? Yep. Okay, so if you make sure they get on there, please. Thank you. Council Bottomman? Could I just ask that we all get a copy of the ordinance? I don't yes. recall seeing yes. the ordinance. Okay. That, that'll be in your packets. Any other counselors for new business or new agenda items? Because that is part of this little blurb. Because if no one else does, I have a few. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, what I would like to do is if we could get on the workshop for the 17th. I know Councilor Quox had discussed the situation with um, alternates for planning board and Second budget committee. committee. Um, I think that'd be a great thing to discuss, and then we can move forward with it. My goal would be for the, for the workshops that we discuss these issues, and then such as this evening when we came in with the resolution for um, wastewater treatment superintendent, you know, we just flew through it. So um, let's bring that to our workshop. Um, what I would like to do also for the... Um, July workshop to give counselors time and we can research this a little further if we need to um, the legal opinion did say we can um, move the start date of the um, historic district commission to August 1st I trust that all counselors got copies of that if they did not I want to make sure that they do um, so I know we just got it so if everyone wants to read it We'll do that on our July workshop um, and discuss it and see what process we'd like to take. I would like to move this forward. Okay. Um, I would also like to have some discussion on the bid process, if we may, at the next workshop um, on the 17th, as far as potentially having the bids open for the public. You, will you warned me about that. <laughs> yeah, now we spilled the water. Um, uh, you will be at the, at the next workshop. Uh, we hope to be provide, providing you a new purchasing policy. Okay. Revise so we can add that in there. Okay. So. All right. I, I just, you know, would feel comfortable. I know we have dates that these things are supposed to be given for certain reasons and I, I'd feel better if they were actually opened with the full council present I, I think you know we're the ones that ultimately okay the spending so we might as well be the ones that open the bids and if anyone disagrees with that please say so I mean I'm just throwing it out there mm -hmm. um, aren't most bid openings during the day though so that the people who submit bids oh we're the council there. we can <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> traditionally because yeah, no. I've been a person who yeah, has yeah. actually submitted bids and it, you want to usually be there yeah. mm -hmm. one of the things that, one of the things that we've done is in discussing the the purchasing policy sort of broken it up and said that if the budget if the if the purpose of the bid relates to an item that's already been already been approved in the budget that the department head and the town administrator we held the bid opening during the daytime if it's if it relates to an expenditure that comes from the um, either capital reserve or the expendable trust funds that that would come before the council uh, because that's the, that's the council's responsibility to release those funds and have that discussion and stuff so we could have the opening and then allow the department head to take that back and then come back two weeks later and provide a, a review of to whom should receive the bid okay and, and we and again we can discuss that because that's uh, what we have a purchasing policy as one of the items for uh, the next meeting okay and, and I did have a brief conversation with the finance uh, director the other day will he be able to supply the council with encumbered funds from this before the we, end of the fiscal year we, we talked with the department I, heads about that at, the, at our meeting today and um, um, so we're going to be requesting people to fill out purchasing orders uh, so that way we can have that in the in the office to so he he can begin to build that and we'll have some probably okay. um, I don't know if we'll have them all but we'll have the balance of them uh, at least by the business meeting Okay. In July. All right. Then we'll just pencil that in tentatively for the business meeting, yep. if we could. Um, and and that's all I've got. <laughs> Anyone else? Any suggestions or ideas for the workshop? Okay. Then the one other thing I have before we go into our oh, actually we've got a couple of other things. But 
Um, real quickly, um, I have requested, along with the town administrator, a meeting with Upton and Hatfield um, to discuss rules and procedures for um, town councilors or, or councilors. It'll be considered a non-meeting, and I've scheduled this for the 24th of this month, which is a Wednesday, um, 6.30. And it would be nice if everyone could be here, um, especially the new councilors. It'll, it'll, I, I want to do it because that way there we're not rushed to the fact that we've still got an agenda that we've got to deal with and we can ask questions. And perhaps in regard to, um, it's one of the reasons why I really pushed the um, historic um, ordinance to the July because that'll give us a chance to maybe chat with them on on how ordinances you know can get tweaked or whatever um, so the 24th will be um, Upton and Hatfield 630 here correct right. chambers okay I will not be here I'll be out of town that day I'm also going to be on vacation that week <laughs> okay um, no, I do it the week before so that's the 17th. I mean, the week between the, the There is no the week between. Well, the next, the week before is the workshop. Yeah, the 20, 24th, and then we'll go right to the business meeting on the 1st. Well, I know. I'm saying. We're here. Like the 10th? I mean, if <laughs> yeah. we could do it the 10th, I don't have a problem, but. I don't think they'd be ready. I don't, I don't know if they'd be ready or not. I won't be here. On the 10th? Can, can we, we, we'll have they come in at the workshop and just do a non-meeting before I, the workshop? I guess could we could we have a um, I, it might be advisable that people could provide us when you anticipate you might be going on vacation and stuff like that. So we can if well, there is a meeting like that, we could at least have an idea and say, well, I know we're going to have two people out here and one person out here. And um, does anyone have a problem with July eighth? If we can push it off there, uh, no, I don't. No. Nope. Can we July check with them? Because yeah. that'll still get us before the workshop on the fifteenth. Okay. Um, so tentatively, July eighth works for everyone. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, Next to agenda items, number eight, town council appointments of reps to committees and boards. I trust that all councilors do know where they're going to be um, at the present time. Um, but for the, just for the record, I will read it off. Um, for the planning board, it's Councilor Bottoman. For the budget committee, it's Councilor Dickens. CIP is Councilor Carr. Municipal audit is Councilor Quox. Conservation commission is Vice Chair Bergeron, Advisory Heritage is Councilor Minutelli, and I will be doing the Black Bear TIF. Um, I'm sorry, Council Carr, did you have a question previously? Or? Oh, no, that was when I said I wasn't going to be in town. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so unless there's no other questions on this, we'll move on to number nine. He's still on school board as well, which isn't listed here. No. Okay. No, that's going to be part of the discussion. You said you were going to be there tomorrow. He, he is oh, going to be there. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I trust he will be there. Um, so no questions on that? I like that. Move on to number nine, which is the town administrator's report. That's what I've got. Yeah, I know. I, I know I have it, but I don't think there was there's anything no. that I was... I, I know you did give us the FYI. I, I gave you an FYI. Yep. I don't seem to have that. Well, what part of it would you like? <laughs> That's not. I don't. I think this is probably what you want yeah. more so than the other part. Um, I just. Uh, um, I received a, a bid from uh, Peter Knight of the Stanhope Group uh, relative to uh, uh, providing me a value for the DPW garage and 321 Ash Swamp Road, which is uh, property that abuts the landfill. <laughs> And uh, they're sending a proposal to me relative to that. Um, we'll be meeting with uh, um, 
we had met up at the water tank uh, to talk about the access and there was a request to obtain from uh, Mr. Malaski how much it would cost to uh, create the new uh, access so that it can be used by uh, propane vehicles in addition to the, uh, the town's vehicles to uh, perform any work up there and he noted, he talk, he noted it would be about, about $10,000 the town crew would do the work. Uh, most of the cost would be in uh, the material and to hire a dozer for a couple of days to uh, grub out the road and uh, move material around. Um, I mentioned that uh, if you haven't uh, seen the uh, the work that's been completed at the memorial down by the Ant Up Association, uh, that's been completed. Uh, I think they just have a small fence uh, uh, to put chain, up chain it? chain link that has to be completed and. Um, one of the things in talking with the, uh, uh, the business association, um, we wanted to uh, get some, um, some press on the fact that we have had five new businesses that have opened up a new market since uh, last year, the end of last, uh, in the fall actually. Um, and uh, start actually tomorrow, there'll be the first ribbon cutting, which will be uh, at 10 o'clock in front of uh, uh, Get a Scoop the new ice cream shop that opened up and then every two every two weeks we're going to have a different one uh what we'd like to do is just let people know that things are happening in new market and in fact uh, met with a an individual who is uh, looking to put in a business in uh the new um what used to be the old chinese restaurant uh downtown next to the uh, uh the tavern uh that's going to be going in there a gentleman is uh, has signed a lease and uh, will be opening in uh looking in probably August to open. There's what type be a, of business? Excuse me? What type of business? Uh, he uh, and his wife are going to be doing soups, oh. different types of soups. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Where is that going to be? The, the old Chinese. Next to the Lampert oh, Tower. Yeah. Nice. So uh, he was going to be in Durham, um, but he went over there and um, um, got discouraged. Um, so he came to Newmarket and there was an opening okay. and he is going to move into it. So. Things are happening in New Market. So. Supers. Once the construction was done. <laughs> well, if anybody can attend the, uh, the ribbon cutting, um, that'd be great. It's going to be right in front of Get the Scoop. Um, we have the reporter here. who will be with the, with the trusted camera. I'm going to be there, yeah. So, great. 10 o'clock, correct? 10 o'clock. 10 in the morning. Yep. Okay. Uh, that's it that I have. Uh, did, did you want to touch on that or no? Um, just as I mentioned earlier, um, I've had uh, uh, received a phone call this week from uh, um, the vice president from PSNH uh, to talk about the uh, um, issues that we have relative to the cost of the uh, downtown um, uh, PSNH work, and we're meeting with him tomorrow uh, to hopefully come to some kind of, uh, of uh, decisions that I can bring back to the council so we can discuss and uh, hopefully resolve this. I did ask them because one of the problems that we are having at the current time is um, the work on PS and H's side of the project has stopped um, because of this problem that we have. And the town has approximately seven hundred thousand dollars in the in the project budget to move to continue to move this on, and I've asked them to to move that if they would get back out there and you know continue to bury and connect lines. So uh, we'll be discussing that also tomorrow and. I'm going to bring up the issue of the lights also. Okay. Any you. questions for the town administrator? Yes, Councilor Clark. Um, any discussion on the June 8th detour that's going to begin Monday, I believe. On the what? Right? Is it the detour starting June 8th on Monday? Yes. Any information Correct. on that? <clears throat> other than it, it, the signs are up and letting people know it'll be one-way traffic uh, going north. Um, okay. And the old detour will be back in place for approximately about two weeks, two and a half At weeks. Packers Falls with yep. the stop sign? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think that uh, <laughs> that uh, Chief Seer will be out there with his, his guys to uh, to do it. I, I think to put the sign up for a short period of time is going to It's you know, yeah. In two weeks. It's going to be one of those things. So Just be getting used to it. It'll be, the stop sign will still be there that's currently at Elm Street in Packers Falls. The flow okay. will still be Packers Falls. But uh, I'm sure that the... Uh, um, they've got that covered. So, and, and also let people know that there's the road race in town on. S yep, there's a road race on uh, Sunday, uh, 5K for anyone that wants to run it. Um, and it's actually going to end down on down at the river. Yes. Yep. 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 
And it's got a lot of people running it too, so just let people know. Uh, Mr. Warnowski, I hate to be a nag, but uh, any updates on the cell phone tower? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be a nag, and um, um, other than the fact that all the paperwork that the town of Newmarket requires has been submitted, it's just a matter of them pulling a permit to get up there and do the work. I can't, I can't do anything, anything better than that, <laughs> any more than I can do anything with PSNH. That's all I ask. Yeah. Thank but you. but they're, they all I, that's all I have to do at this point, and we're just waiting. We've got the bond in place and all the other stuff. And, yeah. and, and in addition to that, I had a, another cell phone company come in and met with myself and Diane today because they're looking to uh, locate a, another tower in town. Ooh, good. So what you're saying is the, the, the town planner has, or the uh, planning board has approved everything, all the paperwork is... In been done yep. so then might I suggest that maybe the town planner just give these people a call and say hey we're waiting for you to well, come what I, what I do is I um, I communicate obviously they won't call them on the cell phone but they'll call say she can't get a signal <laughs> <laughs> but if we could just possibly have her just you know oh we um, council um, sent an email the other day and uh, you know just to verify that everything is all set Diane sent it back and he sent uh, with a copy to me to uh, to Verizon folk and said, "It's in your court." Okay. So okay. We don't hear anything. I, I generally touch base with them and see about getting it going because I know I hear from there are several people who send me emails and ask me for updates, and I will shoot them an update. So okay. I, I think the best thing that could happen is if Verizon users started calling Verizon and said, "When is the tower going to have you know the antennas?" Um, I know one individual, and I don't, and not putting this out there because I think you should do it, but one individual was promised, you know, good service in Newmarket and was getting such poor service, he called them up and said, this is what I'm getting, and they cut his bill in half. So maybe that's what Verizon users want to start doing with their cell carriers. And maybe we'll get the tower up in a few days, or the antennas, I should say. That's what we're hoping for. Okay. I'm all set. Thanks. Anything else for the town administrator? Okay, then I guess at this point we're looking for a motion, Councilman Minutelli. To for non-public. That's where I'm at. Motion uh, to enter non-public uh, pursuant to RSA 91A colon three Roman numeral two subsection A relative to discussion of compensation of employees. Second. Discussion. Call the vote, please. Council Carr? Aye. Council Minutelli? Aye. Council Bottomman? Aye. Council Quox? Aye. Council Dickens? Aye. Council Bergeron? Aye. Chairman LeBranch? Aye.